remiss or and I like I say we need to lift them up in prayer tonight. It's, it's been some time since I've seen her. She hadn't been able to be back since she come back from Kentucky. And uh and we've got to we've got to try to get that rectified and get her get her back in the house of the Lord and I know she's got some uh, ailments and some things she's dealing with. So just lift this family up, be much in prayer for them tonight. And uh, but we thank you for reaching out to her and uh give her uh uh, tell her you love her and you appreciate her. You miss her. Amen. It does a heart good to know that God's people are praying and uh, that God's people remember each other when we're not able to be there. So thinking about this service tonight, uh, a, a common scripture, one that's probably been preached many times. Uh, I've never preached it, to be honest with you. Of course, there's a lot I've never preached. I've not been preaching that long. So i still got a ways to go, but... If you have your Bibles and you want to read with us, turn to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4. And if you have ever read the fourth chapter of the book of John, you'll find that uh, this chapter deals with the word love, and it explains to us that God is love. Amen. How many of you uh, love the fact that God loves you? I, I love that fact that God loves me, that he He's mindful of me, and he cares about me. Uh, you, you may not call me. Uh, my wife may forget to make supper tomorrow night. You know, there's a lot of things that may happen that may not be in my favor, but there's one thing I can always count on, and that's God loves me. Amen. He don't forget about me. He's never too busy for me. He's not frail like I am or short-minded or uh, exhausted or all the other things that we experience. And it's never that we don't love each other, don't care about each other, but we just forget and we just get busy. We get tied up. We get wrapped up in things and we forget to do the little things that, that we really should do. But my God never forgets about me. He's never too busy, and I know he always loves me. And John uh, very eloquently puts uh, into writing in the fourth chapter of the book of John that God is love. And I just want to read through this, and, and then I want us to uh, just preach as the Lord would uh, reveal this to our hearts and, uh, and help us to understand it. So coming in here in chapter number 4, amen, let's go to, uh, let's see, verse, mm, let's just start at the beginning. How about that? It ain't but 21 verses. You can handle that tonight, can't you? I'll try not to preach all 21 of them. But, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are going out in the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. That's a good way to tell right there who you're dealing with. Amen. You are of God little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I say that all the time. Now you know where it's at. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God, and he that knoweth God hears us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So John begins to explain something to you. He said, the world, they that are of the world, when they speak, the world hears them. You're of God. The people of God hear you, but the world's not paying you any attention. When we hold them signs up or when we go door to door, the world's not going to necessarily embrace our effort because the spirit of the enemy is going to raise up and try to discourage our effort because the world's not interested in hearing truth. And he said, hereby... Know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So because of this, we understand, we know uh, uh, the spirit of truth, which is those that are uh, uh, witnessing about Jesus Christ, that he's come in the flesh, witnessing and living and, and, and being an example every day about what and who God is. That's the spirit of truth. And we also know the spirit of error, those that confess that Christ has not come in the flesh. And they try to do everything they can to lead you away from faith in Christ. But he said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. 
And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son in the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is the stand-in for our sins. That word propitiation means that He took our place. He became sin who was not sin or knew no sin. He became and took upon him of that sinfulness and he ab uh, absorbed it in the sense that the blood of Jesus, his shed blood, cleansed unrighteousness and sinfulness. So we can say honestly that sin has been forgiven, but it's not according to or it's not uh, applied to the account until you ask for forgiveness. And when you ask for forgiveness of your sin... That blood that washed sin and cleansed sin, he's not on the cross again doing it again for every person that comes to him. He done it once. And his blood is still cleansing sin and, and still as people repent, it's still washing, amen, even the new convert today and tomorrow and the next day until Jesus comes. But we understand something here. He is our, our in-between or he went in our place and he took that sin. So whenever we accept him and ask forgiveness, it's applied to our account. And here he says, uh, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also to love one another. Now, we're coming at a crucial time in our, in our world affairs. And it's easy for people to cast stones and to say things about others and to make stands and to make statements and to be bolsterous about our opinions and about where we and how we feel. But first and foremost, let us remember that we are children of God. And there will be no hate in heaven. Regardless of what we feel about this one or that one or one's color or one's gender or one's this, that, or the other, if we hate, oh, we're fitting to get there. <laughs> mm. A little teachy tonight. But it'll help us to walk straight. Amen. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, then God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Yeah. So though we have not seen him face to face, but yet he dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us, if he so abides us, if we've accepted him, he abides in us. Yeah. Hereby know that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. This is how we know that He is in us and we are in Him because we have the Spirit of the living God in our hearts. Brother Chris, I'm not sure. Oh, you can know. You can be made sure. Amen. Well, I don't know how to feel about this one or that one or the other. Well, the Bible tells us how we ought to feel. It's not up for debate how we want to feel. It's how God says we are to feel. If we are in Him and He in us, amen, we are to love one another. That's easy to say and harder to do. But we have to be reminded of who we are. We can get caught up in our political stances. We can get caught up in our, our family traditions. And we can get caught up in our, 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 our uh, geopolitical stances or our educational stances or, or, or how we feel about this or that. And, and we can say things sometimes without thinking it through. And we find ourselves hurting others because of things we say. If we face these things with the Spirit of Christ in our hearts, I'm not looking forward to this election on either side. I'll just be honest with you. But I do feel like one is better than the other. But my hope is still in Christ. <laughs> hey, man, God, please save us from this catastrophe that's fixing to happen in this country. It's been happening for the last 30, 40 years. It, it's not gotten better. It's only gotten worse as we've gotten away from the cross <laughs> over 2,000 years now and you see where we are it was better 40 years ago than it is today it was better 20 years ago than today so you, it's steadily getting worse don't matter who's in the house whether it's white black whether it's Democrat Republican Independent it doesn't matter what the team is doing amen they're going to lose they're going to win you know all these things are washed out but what are we doing and how are we living for God and do we love one another 
Let's finish. And hereby know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have his spirit living in our heart. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. That's our testimony. That's our testimony. We, we testify that Jesus Christ came and hung and died on a cross, was buried three days, resurrected, and, and was seen, amen, uh, above 500, as Paul said. Uh, and then he uh, went back to the Father where he's making intercession on our behalf. This is our, our testimony. If you don't know nothing else about how to talk to somebody, you can tell them, amen, that I believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins. Uh, and how do you know that, Sister Janie? How do you know that, Sister uh, What do you mean, Sister Bed, that Jesus come and die? That makes no sense to me because I have his spirit living in my heart. I could not do the things that I do. I could not act the way I act. I could not talk the way I talk, amen, except the spirit of the living God lives in my heart and it rules and reigns. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has to, has to us. God is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. I like this scripture. Herein, that word herein is the reason why is our love is made perfect. Why is our love made perfect? That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What he's saying is, is we have confidence in our love that dwells in us because it didn't come from me. Amen. The love that I have didn't come from me. I know that's kind of crazy to think that, but it came from God because God now lives in, and God is love, and because He lives in my heart, I am able to love others. Amen. Before Christ came into my heart, I, I had an affinity or I had a lust for things. Uh, I, I could say the word love. I had a, some experience with love, uh, but I truly didn't understand or know love until Christ came into my heart. Amen. God is love. What does he tell us? And we have seen and do testify the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known. Or, 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 so herein is our love made perfect. The reason why our love is made perfect is so we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That day of judgment is to come and to pass over all men. It's appointed once unto men to die and then the what? The judgment. So we're going to stand before God and give an account of that which we have done in this life. Every outer word, every deed is going to be judged accordingly. But guess what? When the child of God stands before him, we stand with the blood applied. Amen. Woo, hallelujah. Well, that's the reason right there to shout. Because the last time I stood before a judge, I had no defense. Amen. I was guilty as charged, and I had to suffer the consequences. But when I stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the judges of all judges, uh, I'm going to stand there, amen, with the blood of the precious Son of Jesus Christ applied to my heart. Uh, and He's going to look at me, and He's going to say, You belong to me. Come on in. The blood covers it. Can I say again, the blood covers it. If we walk in repentance... If we are truly repentant in our heart. And that means a daily course of action of God, forgive me if I've strayed. Forgive me if I've said or seen or done something. God, always let me be a salt and a humble heart to be mindful, amen, to keep my calling and election sure. I don't want anything to be between me and you. Hallelujah. That's why we can have boldness in the day of judgment because the love that we have for everybody for ourselves, our spouse, our God, all this comes from Him. If it was dependent on my love, <laughs> if He told me, Chris, you got to love everybody, but He didn't give me of His love, and I had to do it based on my ability to try to love, I'd fall short. How can you love the wayward? How can you love the sinner? How can you love the murderer, the homosexual? How can you love the, uh, uh, the black, the white, the yellow, the green? How can you love all these people? This one done me wrong. That one done me wrong. This one ain't right. This one's disobeying God's word. This one's doing that. This one's over here. And how can I love these people? Because that love doesn't originate inside of you. It comes from God the Father. The reason we have people struggling to come together in unity is because they've not been born again. Now, granted, there are things that are wrong. The murderer needs to stand trial for murder. 
in my opinion, homosexuality is a sin and it's wrong. The child molester is wrong and, and will face the punishment for such crimes. The adulterer, the stealer, the thief, these things will be dealt with. But my place is to love them. And it's not my ability to love them that I have to depend on. But it's the love, amen, that comes into my heart at the moment of confession, amen. And when he comes and takes his abode in me, now I can love everybody. I don't have to sit with everybody. I don't have to stand with them in what they're doing wrong. I don't have to go to the places they're going to. But I can still love them and pray for them. Hallelujah. So herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's a lot of statement right there. Listen to that. Because as he is, who is he? He's talking about himself. As he is, as God is, amen. As he is, so are we. Now that doesn't make us gods, but what it says is that because he is in us, Amen. Our love is made perfect in him. And what's taking place here as we have been translated from, uh, from outside of the covenants and the promises of God. We have been taken from a sinner. Amen. And that which is lost and undone and unfit for anything. And we have been made perfect in Christ Jesus through the blood of Christ. Uh, and now we have become, amen, acceptable unto God. As he is, so are we in this world. We are acceptable unto him. Amen. He loves us and cares for us. Uh, hallelujah. And it's more so, amen, because we have turned to him and said yes. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3 verse 16 that for God so loved the world. Now I, want to, I want to make a statement here that's going to sound somewhat harsh. And people are so adamant about God loving them while they're sinning. The Bible says that for God so loved the world in other words, there is a genuine love for His creation and what He made. But while we're sinning, God is certainly not pleased with that. And while we're disobedient and while we're doing things that are contrary to sound doctrine and His Word, while His love sent His Son to the cross, while Jesus would come to the cross and die for us because of the love that they have for this world and because they want to redeem this world. Uh, and understand this, that man without the blood of Jesus cannot be redeemed. Uh, and if it had not been for the finished work of Christ at the cross, uh, we would forever be separated from God. But because He came, because He loved us, uh, even while we were sinners, even while we were destroying ourselves, even while we were tearing him apart uh, or hurting him uh, in the sense uh, uh, he still loved us and cared for us to come. But he's not pleased. So whenever we, we if, we're care, if we're not careful when we preach the message of love, if we're not careful, we will condone. We will allow people to feel like even though I know what I'm doing is wrong, I'm okay. For God so loved the world that whosoever should believe on him should have everlasting life. Whosoever should believe. See, that's the caveat right there that they don't depend on. It's God sent his son. He loves us. We're going to heaven. That's not what the word says. Now, we know that God is love. But here we find out uh, uh, that the Bible says that here in his love, not only that, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Amen. Amen. He loved us first. All right, so when he loved us, Sister Janie, he's looking from time past to time future. He knows every person, every name. He knows every hair on the follicle of your head. He knows the height, the weight. He knows what you did last year, last summer. He knows the future. He knows the past. He knows the present. So when he loved us, it's not talking about once you became born, but what he's saying is, my creation I love. So when he sends out, that love. There is the understanding that whenever we are cognizant, we are loved of God. God does love us. Now, when we continue in our sin and we continue to be contrary to His Word, it's not that He withdraws His love by no stretch of the imagination. God does not pull or, or pull back His love, uh, but what He allows to happen is for sin, the seeds to be sown, uh, and what's sown will come to fruit. 
And then we'll have to deal with that. Now, what happens is, is it says that he sent his son to be appropriation for our sin. In other words, he says, you don't have to come stand before me in your own effort. He says, I'm going to put my son in the place that everything will draw to him. And he will, in his death, burial, and resurrection, he will take it and crucify it to the cross. Amen. And he will wipe it clean. Amen. And if you believe and trust in that, you can have everlasting life. So this... So we're understanding about the love of God. Now we understand something. Now, so God loves the world. For God so loved the world, it's not on the individual. I don't think it's on the individual basis as much as some people want to put it out there. But it's that God in, in time past loved his creation. And whatever it came out, he loved it. Now, you have to understand, this has been going on since the beginning of time. When did that start? I don't know. When's it going in? I don't know. Only God knows. But think of the countless millions that have come through. Think about those that are still yet to come. At Tiff Region, they're being born about every hour. You hear that little music go off about every hour. They're, they're steadily coming in. And God does love each one. But whenever we come to that age of accountability... And we begin to sin. God doesn't pull his love back. Or God doesn't say, well, because, Chris, you went the wrong way, I'm going to not love you. And Beth, because you I'm going to love That's not what he does. So we, we don't want to put out the, F or the, the information that God doesn't love somebody because they sin. But we have to or certainly understand that if you sin, God is not pleased with that. So we can't condone the sin. And we can't make people feel like because God loves them that they can continue to sin and it'll be all right. Because what happens is, so whenever we understand or we accept the love of God in our heart, when we get born again, he says something happens here. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Now, this is not just words that can be spoken and it be true. What are you saying, Brother Chris? If you run into somebody that was raised up in church, they will tell you, yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I, I believe. So just saying the words does not make it true in your heart. Amen. Amen. The love of God, the thing that happens here, and what we have to combat, the, the modern message which is ruining, in my opinion, people's lives, uh, is that, yes, God loves each and every one. Yes, God loves the sinner. He loves the saint. He loves all manner, shape, form, and fashion. He loves everybody, but he's not pleased with what we're doing until we come to the love of Jesus Christ. And when we come to salvation, that love changes us. We're no longer the same person. And if we continue in our sin and we continue doing the same things that we did before he came in our heart, we cannot express the love of God. We cannot testify that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So in other words, it's not just words that are spoken, but it's a life that's lived. Amen. When Christ comes into our heart, we change. That love changes us, Sister uh, Janie. Uh, the gospel changes. It has an effect on us. We cannot continue doing the same things we did. There must be a change. Why? Because now he dwells in us and he's given us of his spirit. Now let me say this. The spirit of God don't go to the liquor store. The spirit of God don't go to honky tonk. And the spirit of God don't like riding down the road listening to Hank Williams Jr. either. I know a lot of people get crossed at me on that. The Spirit of God is not like doing things that's contrary to His Word. The Spirit of God is not, is not going to be a part of sinful activity. So we can't claim that we love God and that He's in our heart and life and that we are born again if we continue to, amen, mistreat the Spirit of God. Boy, mm. oh, that hurts. That draws it up tight when you got to put that belt on that next level. But how many of you want to go to heaven? I want to go. I want to do what's right. So when we think about it, well, God loves me. That's what you hear people say. And that's why I've probably I've characterized it this way. We, we have preached that God loves people to death. Now, there'll be preachers that'll argue with me on it. Oh, you can't, you can't say that. 
But what we have failed to do, we've preached God is love and God loves you, but what we have failed to do is to preach what happens to us when the love of God comes in our hearts. Amen. So people know God loves them, and now they equate Him loving them with them going to heaven. But that's not what the Word says. The Word says that when He comes in our heart, God is love. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. This is how we know we have fellowship with him. And we have seen and we do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So our testimony has to line up with the Word. Amen. Our words have to line up with Him. Uh, the Spirit of God is not about cussing and fussing and telling dirty jokes uh, and laughing and being a part of the worldly things. Uh, the Spirit of God quickens our heart. Amen. And says, get out of this conversation. Uh, I can't help sometimes what I see. I can't help sometimes what somebody says. Uh, but I can help what I do after it's done. Uh, I can flee from it. Because the Spirit of God is not wanting to be a part of it. I realize we don't live in a perfect world. I realize we live in a world full of sin. So let me say that list to go along with that. When we're dealing with trying to win the world, we may have to hear some things. We may have to get our hands dirty. Our feet may go through some muddy places. We may have to get in the muck and the mire to reach down and to help pull somebody out and to be a, uh, to be a help to them, uh, to be an example to them. So we may have to endure some things, uh, but that's not what I just said. What I said is whenever we, we practice taking part in things that are wrong, that's when the Spirit of God says move. Amen? There's a difference. Please know the difference. So we have known and believed that the love that God hath to us, God is love. Let me say it again. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. So what we have to understand here, it's not simply the word love that's being talked about, but it's the action. It's the conversation, as Paul would put it. It's the lifestyle. When the love of God is in my heart, it changes the person. Amen. Now, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So this gives us the reason why that we have to be changed by the love of God. That in order to have the love of God, it brings us to the place of Christ's likeness. Amen. It brings us to the place where what did Christ do? He loved others. Amen. He went out of his way. He was compassionate. He moved about the city, healing all manner of sickness. Uh, he healed and raised the dead. Uh, he touched blinded eyes. Uh, he was not afraid of the leper. Uh, he was not afraid of the adulteress. Uh, he was not afraid of the situations that caused the church confusion. Uh, he was rather willing to go into those places and love them. Amen. But he did not allow who they were or what they were to change him. Amen. So what we have to understand now is the love of God dwells in us. Now the Spirit of God, and so he's given us his Spirit, and that's how we know that we're in him. Our love is made perfect in that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So the love must change us because when we stand before Him, we cannot stand there in our own effort. We cannot stand before God with our deeds and our records and say, this is what I've done. And it be accounted as righteousness. Uh, Isaiah tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. So when we stand before God holding our deeds and our accords and everything that we've done, our crowns and our uh, 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 tapestries and our uh, uh, clothing, our education and our garmentry that we've accrued in this world, uh, and we take this before God and we say, God, look at what I've done. Surely you can justify me. No. That's not what's going to happen. It's the love. Herein is our love, the love that God gives us, made perfect. Now, it's, it's perfect when he gives it to us. So what must happen is, is his love must do something to us. He doesn't give us an unperfected love, does he, Sister Janie? But it tells us herein is our love made perfect. What he's really saying is our love, when we receive the love of God, it begins a work in us to bring us to, Christ, to Christ's likeness, to shape us and mold us into the image of Christ. We are a, a, a clay on the potter's wheel. 
Sister Ava, now uh, some of us have been spinning for uh, quite a while. Some of us have been spinning for a short time. But nevertheless, no matter, when we come into the love of God, He sets us up on that wheel and He remakes us into what He wants us to be. And sometimes He puts us back up there and continues to work on us. So herein is our love made perfect. And He says, because as He is, so are we in this world. As He is, as He is perfect, so are we in this world. This confuses a lot of uh, good intentions. We understand that we're not perfect in our every word or deed or action. We understand that we're human. And we understand that we should be guided daily, minute by minute, second by second, the Spirit of the living God. There should be no cause of wrongdoing in our hearts. There shouldn't be. What would cause God's love to fail? Nothing. So if the love of God is in our hearts, if He now dwells in us and us in Him, what is the weak link here? He said His love or our love is being made perfect that we may have boldness. He's a work in us. But in theory, when He comes in our heart, we should never fail. We should never fail. We should never say a wrong word. We should never have a wrong thought. We should never hurt anybody's feelings. Every single action and deed from our lips, from our hearts, from our hands should be to uplift the kingdom of God. We should be on our knees daily. We should have knee problems from getting up and down, praising Him and serving Him. Our shoulders should be strong from our hands constantly going up. Uh, we'd have a hard time getting work done because we got to take a prayer break, boss. Uh, I got to go praise God. Uh, I drew my last breath, uh, and I'm thankful for what I have in my heart. Uh, this should be us. Uh, I shouldn't address anybody in an improper way. Uh, I shouldn't look at anybody in a way I shouldn't look uh, but yet God's love is perfect but the problem is me but if I understand this and, under, and understand this that the love of God does not condone what I do wrong and allow me to stay in that and if we're careful if we don't preach in the right order in the context of the scriptures where God's love is cast out and he so loved this world but we've got to believe in him uh, and when we believe in him he comes in us uh, and his love changes us uh, it begins to work in us to perfect us uh, to be like him uh, that whenever we come to cross that river Jordan we will be like him yes. hallelujah amen so to close it we understand two things about love. That God so loved the world. So we understand that. We know that. This is if you get into that break room talk with that certain someone that's always talking about the love of God, but yet their conversation is uh, 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 not of God. When you enter into that conversation with that person that's always talking about how good God is, and then you look at their Facebook post and you see all that they drank and all that they parted on with and all they carried on with over the weekend. What they're saying is, is God loves me so I can do what I want to do. That's not what God's Word says. But somewhere, some preacher has condoned their action and has not held them accountable to the Word of God. And now they believe the lie. And if Jesus comes back, they're going to be found wanting. So whenever you enter in that conversation, when you, when you get that confidence and that boldness and the Spirit of God rises up inside of you and, and they say something that just triggers it and you say, I can't sit silent no longer. I love you, oh God, let me tell you, I love you. But I, cannot, I can't uh, uh, condone this error any longer. The Bible tells us that God is love. You're correct. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 16 that God so loved this world. You are correct about that. But it also tells us if you'll continue to read the Bible instead of the few verses that those preachers you're listening to keep feeding you over and over again, but when you turn to His Word, you'll find out that the Spirit of God, uh, that the love of God is accompanied by His Spirit. Amen. And when His Spirit comes in us, it changes us. Uh, and we are no longer the creature we once was, uh, but we've been changed by the power of the Holy Ghost. And we testify. We testify. Don't tell me you don't have a testimony. 
Don't tell me you don't have nothing to say because you're contrary to what the sound doctrine says. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God and God dwelleth in him and he in God and, he, and we have known and believed that the love of God loves us and God is love and he dwelleth in love and, and the love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. So we begin to, to see the love of God changes who we are. There's no fear in love. So first we understand that the love of God, though it's broadcasted, God does not condone the actions of sinfulness. While He loves the sinner, He hates the sin. That, that's, that's easily for anybody to say. While God loves the sinner, He hates the sin. If your child has cancer, do you hate your child? You hate the cancer, but you love the child. The sin is a cancer in people's lives. Disobedience and rebelliousness, uh, uh, living a life contrary to sound doctrine, it is an epidemic in this world. Uh, yes, God loves me. Don't judge me. Don't look at Don't do this. Don't do that. Uh, let me tell you something who judges you, and it's the Word of God, brother or sister. Uh, and when you line up with this Word, uh, there will be no cause for me to see anything in your life that shouldn't be there. I don't have to judge. The Word of God judges. And because the Word's in me, I see the bad fruit. Mm. So the love broadcasted does not condone sin. When the love of God is recognized and understood or brought into the heart, it changes us. So God's love changes us. We're no longer what we used to be. Now we see there's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. So we understand something else about love. Here we find out that in perfect love, the love of God, if, if I am uh, uh, fearful of what's happening in this world, it's because the love of God is not working in my life. Bottom line. If I'm fearful... Because he says there is no fear in love. Now this word love here is not talking about just any kind of love, but he's talking about his love. And so whenever the love of God is working in our life and it's maturing in us and it's working uh, to perfect us into Christ's likeness, we understand we don't have to be afraid of what's going on around us. When Daniel was cast into the lion's den or the den of lions... How many of you read the account of where Daniel was afraid of the lions? Did you read that? I, I, I haven't found that book in the, in the Bible yet. Uh, they left that chapter out, Brother Darrell. For some reason, God didn't uh, put that in there that Daniel fought them to go in. He didn't want to go in there because it was full of lions and, and they're going to hurt me. They're going to kill me. They're going to destroy me. I can't go in there. I, 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 I still haven't found that chapter yet. I haven't found that verse yet. Why? Because it's not there. Because perfect love casts out fear. How can a man walk into a den of lions and, and not be afraid uh, is something I've yet to walk through. Uh, but what I understand, what I have gone through, and what I have experienced uh, is that the love of God never fails. So that love casts out fear. Fear has torment. Torment. Have you, have you encountered people struggling in life? I'm not talking about just financially, you know, or, 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 or health-wise, but their mind is fearful of everything. They're afraid of everything. And they're tormented. That fear torments them. It's almost as the night comes down, they get so agitated and their anxiety ramps up and it almost they lose their minds at wondering and fearing what might happen. Fear is pre uh, 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 fear has torment present with it. But the Bible says, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man, now this is why I'm going to close it. If a man say, I love God and hated his brother. The Bible says, this is not Chris 5, 5, but the Bible says in John, 1 John chapter 4, verse number 20. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. So what happens whenever you encounter somebody 
who claims to be a Christian and they talk about how much they hate so and so. And when you say you're a liar, well, they're going to get fighting mad. But the Word of God says he's a liar. She's a liar. I had an encounter one time, and I hope this is something I'll never go through again. I had a family member, a young cousin of mine, who was raped by another family member, distant family. It wasn't in our immediate mama's side of the family, but it was my papa's sister's great grand young. So it was in family, but it was still far enough away. And this young boy uh, put himself in a position to uh, molest a young cousin of mine. She was probably 13, 14 years old. He was 15, 16. It's been some years ago. They was at the river. They were doing stuff they shouldn't have been doing. It was a bunch of them. She felt safe because it was family, but they were still drinking and they was playing and acting in ways they shouldn't have been acting. And she come back and she told her daddy, and I can tell you it caused a lot of problems in the family. And there was a lot of words said. And to this day, there's still some animosity there with certain ones. I can't hate him or hate that part of the family. I don't like what happened. I don't condone what happened. And he stood uh, 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 and was punished for what he did. Not, I don't think enough for what he did, but he went through some punishment for what he did. But at the end of the day, I can't hate him. I can't hate her. Or I can't hate none of the family. But I know there's some in my family that still, to this day, they can't get over it. The Bible says, if a man say, I love God. Now, this I love God here is what's really being said here is I'm a child of God. If, I, if a man say, I love God, if he says, I am a child of God, I love God, God is my Savior. And he doesn't love his brother. His brother is anybody now, we have to understand something here. He uses the word, loveth not his brother, whom he has seen. So he's got to be talking about somebody else that also is supposed to be loving Christ. He didn't say it was somebody of the world. Now, now I know we're splitting hairs here. But the word says, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother... Who is our brother? Now, we know our neighbor is anybody. But our brother or our sister is somebody who is also in Christ. Do we understand this? Our neighbor, whenever the Good Samaritan, whenever Jesus was talking about the Good Samaritan, you know, and he says, who was he a neighbor to? And the man, you know, who, who is my neighbor? You know, and Jesus pointed out, you know, and, and it was uh, talking about anybody. That's, right. that's a neighbor. In other words, that's a, a person, and if we can help and we can be a, 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 an assistance to him, we should help and we should always be a, a willing to be an example. But here he's talking about a brother. So here we get to talking about attendance as far as people in churches, people that claim to love God, but then they say, I hate so-and-so. He says, you're a liar. For how can he love God whom he has not seen? If he can't love his brother who he has seen. And this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. So here we understand in closing that the love of God, God loves us but he doesn't condone sin. His love changes us. So when his love comes in our heart, we can no longer be what we used to be. We can no longer say the things we used to say, act the way we used to act. It changes us. And it causes that change in us to be effective in the places that God puts us. It causes that change that's in us to be recognized by those that are in the world. And that change that is in us, though we speak on behalf of Christ and we testify and we say these things, the Word tells us that they're of the world and the world hears them. You're of God and, and the, uh, the godly people hear you, but the world doesn't hear you. So don't be ashamed or afraid or worried when these things start taking place. Be able to speak up about what the love of God does in the heart. It changes us. 
Because when we come to love God, the Spirit of God dwells in us. And the Spirit of God does not do those things. The Spirit of God, the Bible says that God cannot sin. The Bible teaches that God, there's no sin. Uh, when Christ came, uh, though he put upon him a flesh, but yet he did no sin. There was no guile found in his mouth. There was no sin found in anything that he did. He was above that. So even though he adorned this natural flesh, he did it without sin. We are not that way. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the Bible says he's been made a propitiation for our feeling or stand in. He has took our place. And the love of God comes in our heart. And a true child of God, when we understand that we were sinful, lost and undone, headed to a devil's hell. And when we realize the importance that Jesus took my place, it causes us to be humble and to be meek. And it should help us to look at others who are lost and undone and have a heart. It's not always easy to express your salvation. It's not always easy to talk to the world about what Christ has done for us. But I'm praying for this church. I'm praying for you that God would give you the spirit of boldness and that he would loose your tongue and that he would strengthen your heart and give you the courage of the Old Testament saints to be able to stand up and to say, this is why I believe this word. This is why I choose to live the way I live. This is why I don't go there. This is why I don't talk like that. This is the reason why. Because the love of God that lives in my heart has changed me. And I'm no longer what I used to be. And whenever you're a lot like me, hot-headed, sometimes quicker to speak than you are to listen, in my early salvation experience, as I get older, I learn to keep my mouth shut more and listen more. I learned to guard my words because I don't want to hurt. When I talk to the sinful and lost people of this world, I don't condone what they do, but I have to express the love of Christ in a way that the Spirit of God can deal with their heart. I've treated them with a hammer before, Sister Dave Nell. It didn't work. I pointed out everything they were doing wrong, and that didn't cause them to break and come to the altar. I pointed out, you heathen, you're going to die lost and go to hell. That didn't scare them. Jesus, Lord. But can we learn to be meek Jesus. and be humble and love people and let the Spirit of God flow? And I've sat beside the young girl who was caught in the act of adultery, and I've said, God loves you. This church loves you. God is not forsaking you. In the book of Isaiah, it says, Though our sins be like crimson, though we can be washed and our sins can be made or, you know, washed clean as white as the wool. You've got to ask forgiveness. You can't bypass that. <coughs> And with a heart broken, eyes full of tears, I've watched them ask Christ to forgive them. Amen. I've sat beside the alcoholic. I've said, you know, we can point out everything that people do wrong. But when we take the time to invest in them and say, look, I know where you've been. I've been there. But Jesus brought me out. And he wants to do the same for you. Don't bypass Calvary. You can't bypass the altar. You can't get it by absorption. You can't get it by hanging out with the right kind of people. You can't get it by going to the right church. You can only get it when you get on your knees and ask God to forgive you. And the love of God comes in that heart and it changes us. Because now His Spirit lives in me. How can I continue the sinfulness and the waywardness that I was? You can't. 
You can't. Do you fail? Yes. But do you stay down? No. If you would, let's all stand.